Welcome, it's Zirika from Living an Amazing Life. Today's episode, we focus on the book, Good to Great. It's a must-read book. This book summary covers a burning question of how to be a billionaire. Having this book at hand as a reference for your journey to be a billionaire is a must. This book spells out that it's not about building a company like Coca-Cola. Instead, it teaches you the steps that Jim Collins and his team came up with after examining 1,435 companies over a period of 40 years. The main focal point of the book is how did these companies become great and stand out from their competition. The book defines the process that anyone can choose to follow as it's a process that is repeatable and not unique to any one company. To get the same results and to be a billionaire in today's times, the core focal point is discipline, discipline, and discipline. To go from good to great, he mentions something called a flywheel effect. At first, the flywheel is slow and has to pass through three key stages, which is disciplined people, disciplined thought, disciplined action. Once these three stages are well implemented, then the flywheel slowly starts building momentum. And then there is a breakthrough where momentum begins and is self-fulfilling. To go from where you are, which is good, to where you want to be, which is great, we have to go through these three stages. Now, before we dive into the hacks of today's lesson, if you're new to this podcast, then every episode of Living an Amazing Life aims at breaking down ethical hacks used by world-class billionaires, entrepreneurs, scientists, doctors, Olympic athletes to reach their highest performance. And we cover these practical micro lessons distilled in 20 to 30 minutes that you can implement in your own life to be a high performer. So let's get to it. Jim Collins mentions that you have to need three levels of discipline. Discipline one, disciplined people. You must know who to associate with and have the right people on board. It's also crucial to keep them focused on the bigger goal so that you can achieve excellence. Discipline two, disciplined thoughts. By being honest with yourself and facing the reality, thereby avoiding being sidetracked and distracted with numerous tasks and possibilities that stop you from taking action. Discipline 3. Disciplined Actions Is knowing what you need to do to achieve the outcome and what you must avoid. So often, we focus on the wrong tasks and thereby procrastinate or get bogged down with tasks that don't serve us. Jim Collins in his book Good to Great mentions that good is the enemy of great and most people, businesses, settle for having a good life, a good business, instead of training and being the best in the industry. This, over time, opens the door to competition. I mean, if you are good at your job and you keep doing that job well, with no upgrades to your skill, with no motivation to be the best, over a period of time, someone will replace you. The same goes for business. If you keep delivering but not improving your systems and processes, over time, someone will come into the market and take your share of business. Being the best is knowing you are at your A game each day and that you don't encourage mediocrity. There is a reason why we have few billionaires and most people will settle to earn a five to six figure income. To make this shift where you can earn a seven to nine figure income, you have to train at a different level. 
you have to do things differently. There is so much to cover from this book, so let's really jump into it. So the free phase one of discipline is understanding level five leadership. Here, we have to understand the difference between what is a level four leader and what are the level five leaders and what are their qualities. We need to understand what is the most important leadership quality that we need to transition from good to great. Jim mentions that there are five different levels of leadership. So let's go through each of the levels. Level one leader is a highly capable individual. At this level, the leader can make quality contributions and has the skills and talent to do the job. Here, the leader is ambitious and wants the credit and promotion for their skills. Level two leaders are awesome team members. This kind of a leader uses their knowledge and skills to help their team succeed. They enjoy working in a team environment where they can ensure that the team meets the desired objectives and are able to work effectively and productively. Level three leaders These are skillful, competent managers. This kind of a leader has the skills to organize people and resources towards the greater goal that is required to be achieved. They can outline and delegate tasks and they know who they need on board to get the job done. They can run and manage multiple teams effectively. Level four leaders are the effective leaders. The leader here is able to motivate people to see the bigger picture of the organization and the vision of the company. They stimulate people to deliver at a very high performing standard. This is where most CEOs of companies may reach and many founders of startups may reach. So what is a level five leader? They are usually executives. This leader sits on top of a hierarchy. Through their career, they have moved through the various leadership traits to reach to the top. This leader has all the four levels we have recently discussed and have special attributes that make them excel to being a level five leader. So what are the characteristics of a level five leader? What is the most important leadership quality a level five leader possesses? A level five leader operates against conventional wisdom. The traits of a level five are they do not seek personal credit. Instead, they are modest, humble, and willing to take risks fearlessly. They look for factors outside themselves when things go well, where they can seek to see who within the organization could get the credit. When things don't turn out the way it was supposed to be, they don't look to find someone to blame. Rather, they own up to taking responsibilities for their action and results of the organization. They look for circumstances and case studies where desired results exist so that they can imbibe those results for their own organization. They look at setting up systems and people who could run everything in their absence and thereby their aim is to create legacy. They are driven to produce sustainable, measurable results and do whatever it takes to reach the desired outcome. So if you visit www.livingandamazinglife.com, the blog goes more in-depth of the various leadership styles that exist and what are these styles. Each of these styles exists in all billionaires. Now here I've not mentioned the different styles because they have not been mentioned in the book Good to Great. And since this is an audio and I want to keep it short and sweet, 
I recommend if you want to know about the leadership skills and styles, please do visit our blog, which is www.livingandamazinglife.com. So let's now go into the phase two of discipline. Understanding the quality of people in your team. Jim Collins refers to this as first who, then what. So what does this phrase really mean? First who, then what? It's the opposite of how we are trained to run projects. If you're starting out in business or are a founder of an existing business, this step is a key discipline you need to embrace. Here you don't go to hire people to do the task. Rather, you get the right people on board first. Getting the right people takes a higher priority than strategy. Once you have the right people, then and only then can you work out what you aim to achieve. People are not your most valuable asset, according to good to great. Rather, it's the right people who will get you to your vision. He further went to demonstrate the benefits of why the who before the what is vital for success. When you know who is working with you, you can adapt to the demands that today's market puts on us. The right people don't need to be micromanaged. They do an awesome job and will advise you when you're making mistakes. They will stand by you in difficult times and cheer you along the way in good times. In Jim Collins' words, I don't know where we should take this company, but I do know that if I start with the right people, ask them the right questions and engage them in vigorous debates, we will find a way to make this company great. With this approach to finding the right people, you will experience that the right people will stay with you for a very long time or will quickly get off and leave your company in a hurry. In other words, your retention will be better rather than a higher churn rate. With this philosophy in mind, it's important to put these right people on the biggest opportunities and not to solve problems. There is a shift in mindset here, and that's what differentiates the billionaires from the ones who don't reach this level. To follow this philosophy, Jim Collins recommends the following approach in Good to Great to finding good, the right people. Strategy one, when you are in doubt of what step to take, don't hire, just keep looking. Sometimes when we are in a hurry, we make mistakes and may hire the wrong person for the job due to our need to rush. Instead, when you don't have clarity, it's important to take time to be clear before hiring. Strategy two, though sometimes it may be difficult to take these steps to be successful, you must let go of the wrong person. Before you take the step though, make sure you analyze if the person is the right person for the organization, but may be in the wrong position. If that's the case, then move the person or create the right position for that person before actually firing them. Strategy three, do not put your best people to solve problems. Rather, put them to work on the biggest opportunities that you see. If you then go ahead and sell off your problems, make sure that you do not sell off your best people in the process. Phase three of discipline. Confront the brutal facts. This step enables the company's team to put the company performance first ahead of ego and people's own personal agenda. Good to great leaders and organizations focus on making a lot of good decisions and execute a plan well. To make these micro decisions and execute them well, people need to confront facts even when the facts are uncomfortable and brutal. 
To avoid distorting the facts, it's crucial that the environment in which people operate is an environment which encourages ownership. And for the person to own up to the truth while taking responsibility for their actions. So how do we create this atmosphere? First step, lead with questions, not with answers. Leaders that operate from the mindset of good to great start by assuming they don't know the answer and they are prepared to ask questions until the true picture gets painted and the truth is discovered. Step 2. Engage in dialogue or debate with no force to do something against people's will. To own up to the brutal facts, we must engage in conversation. You can have debates and arguments so that there is an agreement that is reached. It's widely important to note that this, that this does not mean to force anyone on the team to be threatened or forced to do something against their will. Jim mentions in his own words, spending time and energy trying to motivate people is a waste of effort. The real question is not how do we motivate our people? Instead, if you have the right people, they will be self-motivated. Step 3. Autopsies without blame. To be brutally honest and examine how to overcome a challenge, it's vital to try to understand what actually happened and for leaders in the organization to shoulder responsibility. Create a culture where people are willing to participate and review bad decisions that were made without blaming any particular individual. This allows people to speak up and give the true picture without worrying of being blamed. By making the right decisions, by having the right people as a team, you can seek to learn from a specific situation and avoid such a situation again. Step 4. Build red flag mechanisms. To be brutal and face the truth, You don't want people hiding the burning issues. Instead, you want everyone to alert the team of issues that cannot be ignored. It's better to raise issues as soon as possible so that there is a course of correction sooner rather than there is no point of return. The body shop founder, Anita Roddick, would give every person working in her team 10 red envelopes. If they had any concerns, they could write a letter and hand the red envelope to a member of the board. The board would address these items in their meetings. Jim Collins came up with the red flag mechanism when he observed Bruce Wolpert, who was known for his hard work ethic. He was often working seven days a week at a company his family founded in 1900s called Granite Rock. This company operates in the construction industry. Bruce Wolpert had adopted something called short pay that gives the customer full power to decide how much to pay on an invoice based upon their subjective evaluation of how satisfied they felt with the quality of the product and level of service. When asked why Bruce had the strategy in place, his answer was, you often don't know that a customer is upset until you lose that customer entirely. Short pay acts as an early warning system that forces us to adjust quickly long before we could lose that customer. Confronting the brutal facts allows anyone to adapt your plan every day and stead, stay ahead of your game. Now, before we can dive into phase four of disciplines, let's quickly cover the Stockdale paradox. So what is the Stockdale paradox? Here, the idea is that you need to have a balance between realism and optimism. The concept is named after a U.S. Navy Wise Admiral, James Stockdale. He was held as a prisoner of war for over seven years, 
and during this time was brutally tortured and had no reason to believe he'd make it out alive. When he was asked how he survived this environment, he mentioned that he never doubted the fact that he would survive and that he would make this experience a defining experience of his life. He also accepted the harshness of his situation and the hell he was in. When Stockdale was asked which kind of people didn't survive, Stockdale said it was the optimists, the ones who believed they'd be out by Christmas or Easter or Thanksgiving. Whenever the other prisoners said, we're going to be out by Christmas, then Easter, then Thanksgiving, his response was, we are not getting out of here by Christmas, deal with it. By saying this, he was telling himself that he was going to get out at some point. However, it may not be by this Christmas and to deal with that reality. When many Christmas dates came and went, most of the other prisoners started losing hope and died demoralized. So if you carefully observe the Stockdale paradox, it involves having the discipline to confront the brutal facts about your current situation, but at the same time involves never losing faith that you will succeed in the end. Phase 4 of discipline, the hedgehog concept. The fourth phase of going from good to great is the hedgehog concept. This concept was based on an ancient Greek parable which stated, The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. Many people choose to be foxes. Very few are hedgehogs. If you observe a fox carefully, the fox will use many strategies to catch the hedgehog. And yet, every time it walks away being defeated. The fox never sees that the hedgehog knows one thing, and that is to defend itself. Jim Collins suggests in his book, Good to Great, that if you can identify the one thing you do best and put your heart and soul in making that your hedgehog concept, then you will not only survive, but you will thrive. Now, how do we create a hedgehog, you may ask? Well, you've got to ask three different questions. And let's make this as three different circles. The intersection of these three circles will give you your hedgehog concept. So here are the questions. First, what do you feel most passionate about? Second, what can you do best in the world at? And third, what drives your economic engine? So let's cover what do you feel most passionate about. If you want to live a great life, it's crucial to know what you are already passionate about. See within your team what others are truly passionate about. And then look for projects that are aligned to those passions. What can you be best at the world at? That's your second question. Here the focus is to develop your core competencies. It's about picking a key area that you can do so well that no other business can do. Once you know this core strength, then it's about doing this over and over again so that no one else can compete with you. It's crucial to recognize that this strength is a strength that you already possess, not a strength that you want to be good at. There is a difference in the way we have to think for this question. Question three, what drives your economic engine? What is the one factor by which you can create money for your life and your business? You have to think of the economic engine as your bloodline that keeps pumping blood into your system to keep you healthy. This engine does not define who you are. Rather, it's an engine that gives you a way to survive for a very long time without which we won't be able to live. 
Once you find the intersections between the three questions, which is your passion being the best and the area that you can generate money, then that's your hedgehog. Good to great individuals and companies set their goals based on this hedgehog concept. This is a very different way of thinking as the traditional way to set goals. What we are going to cover from here on will only make sense once you have your hedgehog nailed down. So phase five of discipline, which is culture of discipline. Most people and businesses fail because they lack implementing this phase in their life and business. A culture of discipline means having every team member on board to take action consistently with the hedgehog concept. Don't make the mistake that many people get themselves into, which is they start thinking that they can take control over a project, thereby implementing discipline. This is not the truth. There are five things for this phase that is crucial to be implemented, that is to create a culture of discipline. Step one, build a culture of freedom and responsibility but within a defined framework that everyone has agreed to implement. By choosing to believe and have faith in yourself and the people who have chosen to work with you will set yourself up to think bigger and be free. You will free up your time if you place a framework in place where people can decide how to act and implement certain tasks each day. Your main responsibility is to manage the system itself, not the people. If you look at the airline industry, an airline pilot flying an aircraft is guided by the air traffic control system. The pilot has the ultimate responsibility within the system to get from point A to point B by taking ownership for the safety of the passengers and the crew. So in this step, Make sure you have a framework and give the freedom to everyone operating in the framework to do what they're good at. Step two, to create a good culture. Get the right people on board. We have already covered this before and this step is to reiterate it's crucial to recognize that to go from good to great, you have to have the right people on board. You need the right people who are willing to confront the brutal truth, follow the hedgehog concept, and have discipline to do what's needed to be done to reach the objectives defined. Step three is to build a strong culture. Do not be a dictator or encourage any sort of dictatorship. To be truly great, you must create a culture where everyone wants to achieve. Even in your family, encourage other family members to explore what they're passionate about and don't be a dictator or a controller. Step four, focus on your hedgehog concept. If we focus on too many things, we will just get an average result. Avoid all the nice to have features that you think would be good to implement. Just focus on the core. You will see by focusing on one thing and doing it to perfection will in fact create more opportunities than if you try to do everything. And step five, create a stop doing list. Change the way you plan. Instead of thinking of multiple projects, think which projects are in alignment of my hedgehog concept. Those that will make you money. Projects you don't see a revenue model, scrap them no matter how good they might look. Good to great brings up a very important point while covering this chapter. It says, just having discipline is pointless. Taking discipline in alignment with your hedgehog concept makes all the difference. So I hope you can see the fine line for discipline. It's not about just having discipline. It's about having discipline on the hedgehog concept. Phase six of discipline, technology accelerator. Everyone is running towards the next awesome technology hack. Good to great looks at technology in a different light. 
People who have transitioned from good to great only adopt the right technology advancements that serve their hedgehog concept. So having multiple social media accounts and platforms where you can do an average job is not serving you. Instead, it's delaying your success. Here are the steps that good to great companies adopt while looking at technology. Step one, technology in alignment with the hedgehog concept. Always ask the question, how does this new technology fit my overall hedgehog concept? Only if it fits, we adopt this technology stack in our lives. Step two, become a pioneer of technology that aligns with your hedgehog concept. Speed and build momentum with the right technology that you currently have at your fingertips. These could be your business tools, devices and apps that you already possess, but use these apps and technology to the best of its advantage. Step three, use technology in unique ways. Since technology needs to be used only when it's aligned with the hedgehog concept, use all the benefits of technology in ways other than that what was intended of it. Step four, maintain a balanced view of technology. Always, always remember, view technology as being important and only adopt technology to serve your hedgehog. Do not dabble and play with the latest fads of technology just to be seen as adopting a new trend. Now let's cover the power of the flywheel. At the start, we covered that to gain momentum and to have a self-fulfilling life and business, we need to create a flywheel. Let's understand the flywheel in more depth now. Imagine a very large flywheel. It weighs thousands of kilos. To spin that flywheel, you are going to start by pushing. As you begin to push, you may see it shift a little bit. The more you push it, the more it will turn. As you first push the flywheel, you will find it almost impossible to keep pushing. But if you keep pushing it, the more you push, the more momentum you get to see how it builds a form of energy. With momentum, you see it's easier to push it and you start pushing it harder out of excitement. At some point, this giant flywheel will take a life of its own and will start spinning so fast that it does not need a lot of pushing for it to spin. In fact, it gets to a point where it's very difficult to stop. When this happens, you have put a great flywheel in place. When your flywheel is spinning, People want to join you in pushing your flywheel. The media will be obsessed to talk about your flywheel. Everyone around wants to be part of your flywheel. When anyone asks you, how did you manage to spin your flywheel so fast? You won't have an exact answer apart from the old age sentence. I started pushing. It was tough at first and then got easier. A key concept to recognize no single push makes a difference. No matter how much of pushing you give, you just have to keep pushing. It's a cumulative effect and not a dramatic singular push. To make sure you appreciate the flywheel effect, the good to great book also spells out the loom effect. So what is the loom effect? Here individuals and businesses start with a great idea. But then they work on it in short waves, giving it pushes here and there with no consistency. Over time, this leads to poor results. This in turn causes them to dabble and switch track because the previous one did not work. Each time they switch, they lose momentum to make the flywheel turn. This is usually seen when there is a new trend and people switch tracks that they never got to experience the true meaning of the flywheel. They never get to experience true freedom. So there you have it. 
to summarize what we have learned so far. And I know it is a lot of information. So what I've done is I've created a checklist that you can use to make sure you can always stay on track so that you can build a great company, a great life. And you can find this at www.livingandamazinglife.com. So let's summarize the steps. Step one, we've got to understand what it takes to be a level five leader. Step two, we have to understand the quality of people that we associate with and to bring the right people on board. Step three, we've got to understand that we have to face the brutal truth. Step four, we have to understand our hedgehog concept and to do the exercise to create our hedgehog. Step five is to understand the culture of discipline, where it's not only about having discipline, but having discipline on steps that create true wealth by being in alignment with our hedgehog concept. Step six is understand when to um, embrace technology in your hedgehog concept. And step seven is understanding the power of the flywheel and the loom effect. So if you've enjoyed today's episode, then would you be kind enough to leave a review on Apple, Spotify or Google podcast? It would really help me. Also, please do share this piece of work with anyone who would benefit from building a great life using the principles of good to great. If you find my work valuable, then do subscribe to our podcast either on iTunes, Google Podcast, or Spotify. The podcast is called Living an Amazing Life. Just search for it as one word. We also have a YouTube channel. And again, the channel is called Living an Amazing Life. I hope you have enjoyed this episode and you create a great life that enables you to design an amazing life. Thank you. And I look forward to spending time with you in our next episode. Don't forget to visit our blog at www.livingandamazinglife and download the checklist. This is a reminder of all the steps we have covered today from good to great. See you soon. Ciao for now. Take care.